I don't know if Susan and Sandy and Ruth could have picked a song that means more to me. When I was a young guy, just getting started with the Father and with the Lord, there was a guy named Keith Green you may have heard of. He was a great piano player, a Jewish guy who converted to Christianity. If you don't know his story, I would encourage you to go back and learn a little bit about it. He opened his home to people. He did anything he could. He was so amazed with the gospel. It changed his life, and he went down in a plane crash with his little boy. I'll never forget it when I learned of it. I was devastated, devastated. I, I argued with God, how could this be? I was actually had been on a committee to help bring him to Columbus for a concert, and we were making preparations, and it just blew me away. And this guy really impacted my life, and every now and then I will go back and listen to some of his music. If you don't know Keith Green, go back and find that song, There is a Redeemer. There's something about his voice and the way he sings, but uh, thank you for that. And the other point is this last song we sang, and I got choked up, and I was singing that. If you've never I grew up in a church where you prayed on your knees. And I don't know your style of praying, but if you've never done that, there is something, something humbling and something that brings a spirit of adoration and recognition of how helpless we are as creatures on this earth. And so I encourage you and I encourage myself to remember that because it's easy to pray standing and sitting and closing our eyes and all the things that we do, but there's something humbling about bowing our knees to Almighty God. Father, all we can say is thank you. All the planned words I had in my head for this prayer have gone out the window. And all I ask, Lord, is that what we say and do would please you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, and I'll say a couple things real quickly. I, I told my wife, I don't know why it is. I've only done this a few times up here. I'm much more comfortable up here than I am when I do the announcements. I don't know what it is, but there's something about being down there and looking over the bulletin. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I just can't get my head around that. And I stand up here and I, I, I struggle. When I get up here, I guess because I've studied the slides and I know what I'm going to say, it's a little bit easier for me. So if I forgot announcements important to you, forgive me, look in that insert. They are there for your reading. We have many activities that are great for your participation, and I would encourage you uh, to do them. Now, this is a story in the book of Acts, uh, continuing, uh, continuing Mike's uh, series or the series of the church through the book of Acts, and we come to a fairly familiar passage of scripture to Christians, people that know the scriptures, but for many people who, who do not, we welcome you to uh, to get, uh, get familiarized with these scriptures today. But I want you to know that this is a, uh, these next few minutes will be truly an original. They are really for me. This is not something I, I didn't tap into uh, artificial intelligence. I didn't listen to a bunch of sermons online. I didn't read a bunch of, con this is strictly me studying and thinking about these scriptures. So if you like it, blame nobody but me, okay? I mean, if you don't like it, don't blame anybody but me. Uh, okay, let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide. Take, we're going to take a look at these verses. We're going to probably skip through the 13, 14, 15, something like that. We'll get to 16. But on the first day of the week, and you'll notice that I undersize, under, underline certain words, and some of these words will be highlighted in some of the remarks that I make as we go forward, okay? On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And we'll stop right there and just say that he was, he was going to make his way to Jerusalem. He wanted to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So he's planning on leaving the next day, okay? And he prolonged his speech until midnight. Now, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. I don't know how much longer, but it's already midnight. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. And one of the translations that I particularly like says he was lifted up as a corpse. Uh, go ahead, uh, Stu, if you would. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, do not be alarmed or horrified. His life is in him. And when Paul had gone up in a broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. 
And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. And you read, read that in, ita- in italics or italicized, I put there and underline it. We're not a little comforted. Keep that in mind. And then to jump down to verse 16, he was hastening to be at Jerusalem if possible on the day of Pentecost. Likely his great desire was to be there, not in order just to keep the feast, but to, uh, but to have an opportunity to speak to people that would be there from all over the world, the Jews that would come in for the, uh, for the day of Pentecost. So he wanted to be there. Okay, let's move on now, if you would, to the next slide. Now, I said this is an original. So I sat and sat and sat, and I thought, what can make this come alive? What really was happening that night? And so I thought there must be three or four things that we should focus on. One is the audience. Who was sitting there? Now, Paul is at Troas, the city Troas. And there's not really any record of how many people were there. There's really no record of a church that was there in the scriptures. But he's been there before. That's where he got the famous Macedonian call. And he leaves. Now he's back. And there's not a lot about it. But And I'm careful not to read too much into the white spaces of scripture. But there are certain things that we can uh, understand by reading Paul's letters and by reading about his uh, travels through the book of Acts that help us to realize. So let's take a look and think about who might have been sitting where you are listening to Paul uh, in the room, however he was standing or whatever. Okay, go ahead. Now, if you think about it, there were those, if you look back just a few verses before, there were those that had been with Paul. He sent ahead to Troas. He stays behind. He comes in a few days from Philippi. But he sends ahead this group of people. And we know that in that group of people, there were certainly some Gentiles. And we know that Paul had made this famous declaration uh, in the book of Galatians, where he said, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male, there's no female, you are one in Christ Jesus. And we can just about bet that there were Jews sitting there. And I put this up. Remember that the scriptures say, to the Jews, Jesus the Christ was what? Crucified was a stumbling block. All right, keep that in mind. To the Gentiles, it says it was foolishness to have a Savior that was crucified. And so these are the audience members. There might have been men, there might have been women, there might have been slaves now, there might have been masters, there might have been rich, there might have been poor. But all these people have come together. Now let's go ahead to the next slide. I said that to say this, because the topics that he discussed, the idea that's spoken here is that he prolonged his discourse. And this has the idea, this was not just a lecture, not just a talk, like me standing here and talking till midnight. This is a discourse, okay? So there's back and forth, there's discussion, there are questions. Then let's look about what some of those might have been on that evening. All right, now, I put this up here in quotation marks. It's easy for us, 2,000 years later, looking back, to be thinking about settled theology. Well, we know this, we know this. Say this, believe this, do this, do this, do this. We've got it down. We've had the scripture. We know what, we know what the routine is. We have to remember when you go back 2,000 years ago, now we have Jews and Gentiles coming together. And let's think about some of the topics that might have been of interest to that group. And Paul might be getting questions about these things. Let's discuss a crucified Messiah. Idol worship. Meat that was offered to idols. You can remember reading about that in the book of Romans, uh, or the book of Corinthians, I think it is. Meat offering, uh, both. Uh, meat offered to idols. What foods can we eat? What foods shouldn't we eat? Circumcision. The Sabbath. The first day of the week. Those that are weak in the faith. Those that are strong in the faith. Breaking of bread. The coming kingdom. Paul's authority. And we're going to spend some time talking about that affliction, the things that they were facing in that church. This is Jew and Gentile coming together to take on these these discussion points. So I want us to get a feel for how something like this could go on for these kinds of hours. I don't view this as a um, humorous kind of thing where we just make jokes about, well, there's a long sermon, so the guy falls asleep and falls out the window. That happened, but I think there's reasons for the the length of of the discussion. Okay, let's go on now. So let's take a minute and talk about the speaker. Now, I don't know if he was at the front of the room. I don't know if he was seated at a table. I don't know how it was. But Paul is there to have this chat with his friends. And let's go on. So I want us just to think about this for a minute. Standing in front of them was the man uh, to whom is attributed writing 13 or 14, if you include Hebrews, of the New Testament books. Okay? Now think about that. 
That's who's standing there. So in his head are the writings of the letters we just call our scriptures, our Bible, all right? 2,000 years later, the words that he penned and sent to those churches are still read by millions around the world every day. Sometimes when we, think, we just read, well, Paul's there in this, we don't think about this. Think of the knowledge, think of what he has to bring to the table for that discussion. And let's take a look a little bit more about that. Now, if you go back and think about when, think about when Paul, Saul at that time, was on his way to gather Christians up and persecute them, and he's stricken by the Lord, and he's knocked down, and he's blinded for three days. We all know that story very well. And I want us to remember one thing. There's something about Paul that, that's very interesting. He held the cloaks, the clothing of those who were hurling stones when Stephen was put to death, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know the scripture, Stephen was a great Christian guy. He's uh, taken uh, out and stoned to death, and Paul was standing there. And that did something to Paul. Initially, it fueled his passion. It drove him further. He's on his way to continue to gather men and women and throw them into prison because they're proclaiming Jesus as the Christ. And why would he do that? And we forget sometimes, but to the Jews, he thought he was doing God's service because to the Jews, anything other than the worship of the one God was idolatry. And the Jewish people, he's a saying he remember, he had great difficulty accepting that. So he thinks he's doing God's service and he's persecuting men and women. And he has actually seen, now think about this, if you've never gone back and looked at the history of stoning people, I did that. That is not a pretty thing. And if you think about that, and he was standing there as this happens, and so that never, ever, ever left him. And I think that's why he wrote later, I am the chief of all sinners. I am the chief of sinners. I, I, was, I persecuted the church of God, but I did it ignorantly, he said. He didn't know. But he learns quickly, and on his way, uh, on his on his way to Damascus, he's he's stricken down by God and by Jesus, and he sees this great light, and he's blinded. We all know that. But there's this man across town named Ananias. Some of you know that, and he is told to go talk to Saul. And Ananias kind of has a chat with the Lord. You know, I'm not sure you want me to do this. This guy's been known not to have great love for us Christians, and I think I'd be trembling like he was. But he goes. But here's what he says to Ananias. This guy, Ananias, Ananias, is going to proclaim my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. All right? So this is a guy standing in front of that room that we're studying this day. Okay? Let's go on. Now, he says something very interesting. He's still talking to Ananias. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And I wrote these different things down here just to remind myself. This word show is interesting. It can, be, it can be read differently. And I don't know how much of this God showed to Paul during those three days he was blind. If you've ever thought about that, he, it's easy. We just say that for three days. But think of being blind for three days. And you're spending your time with the Lord. And you know you were just there when Stephen was stoned. You know what you're about to do. And now this guy, not this guy, the Lord comes, forgive me, the Lord comes, <laughs> strikes you down on your walk blinds you and says, I am the Christ. I'm the person you're persecuting. And for three days, he's there blind. And I happen to think that during that time, some of these things that we're going to get to were being revealed to him. Show by placing before the eyes. Show secretly. Show by words to teach. Show by making known future things and to show plainly. And I happen to think that God did it two ways. I think he, I think he showed these things to Paul during that time and I think he showed them to him as he went on through life. And God made it very clear to him. These are the things that you're going to suffer. Nobody probably could have been a better apostle to the Gentiles than Paul. But he's going to have to suffer great things. All right, let's go on. Now, let's say that I'm Paul and I'm standing before you. And by the end of the, by, by when we get to this point in Acts, most of these things have occurred. All right. He says, I was beaten. You can read about this in 2 Corinthians. I was beaten three times with 39 lashes. You can go back in Deuteronomy and read about that, but probably what they did was they took 13 separate throngs, and there were three of those. So three times 13 is 39, and then you would get three of those across the back, and that will lay your back open, literally lay your back open. And he says three times. Now, if you were in that audience that night, do you think you might have been interested in hearing that guy? You, you want to talk about a Christian? We talk about Christians who are tried and true. Well, that, I think, is tried and true. 
He says, three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned once. They drug me out of the city, left for dead in Iconia. I left, left for dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a half I spent in the sea just treading water, probably hanging on to a piece of wood. Think about that. I've been in hunger. I've been thirsty. I've been cold. I know what persecution is. All right? This is the message he's bringing to them. Now go on if you go to the next slide. He says, listen to what he says, I take pleasure. I take pleasure in reproaches. I take pleasure in persecution and distress for Christ's sake. And a little bit later on in the same chapter we're in today, he says this. He says, the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, in prison, imprisonment, and affliction awaits me. He knows what's coming, and he still has to go. He knows he has to go because God has showed this to him. I think he showed it to him when he was blinded, and I think it should, obviously he showed it to him along the way. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. But I, 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 I was given, he said, this vision that was beyond words. I can't, even, I can't even describe it. It was so great. It was so great that I have to have a thorn in the flesh because I just can't even, I can't even deal with the vision I was given. This is the man that's standing in front of you. Now, let's talk about boldness. Now, this is something a lot of people, I think, it's easy for us to forget about. We just read Paul's letters. We just pick up, let's turn to Galatians. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. We don't put it in the context of these churches, thinking about the travel, the questions they have, the, the disagreements they have. When I said unsettled theology, I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean they were honest people having questions that needed to be answered. So let's look at this bold guy standing in front of you. Now, I want you to think about this. My wife's tired of hearing me say this, and she'll be in the second service, and I'll have to tone it down a little bit. But I've said to her often, can you imagine if someone stands there and says, if anybody, I don't care if an angel comes from heaven, if anybody tells you anything different than I am, let him be cursed. Let him be accursed. That's bold. That's bold. He says, I didn't receive this from any man. I wasn't taught it. I got a revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't consult with anyone. We forget about that. And you read the book of Acts. He says, I didn't consult with anyone. He just takes off and starts proclaiming the gospel. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to those that were apostles before me. I didn't talk to them about what I was saying. After three years, I went. Three years. So he's going around these churches and proclaiming the gospel, telling the Gentiles, you don't need to be circumcised, this, that, no male, no female, no Jew, no Greek, all this, okay? That's who's standing in front of this group this evening that we're talking about. You wonder why they talked until midnight? You wonder why some of the Judaizers, as you read about in scriptures, are out there saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you saying? Word gets back to Jerusalem. Word gets back to other communities. Wherever he goes, these things are waiting for him. What are you saying? What are you saying? And finally, he gets brought back into the Jerusalem council. But remember in Galatians, when he wrote this, he's telling them, I got this straight from the Lord. So he's standing, that's who's standing in front of you. You're at Troas, that's your speaker. Okay, let's go on. Here's what he says to the Ephesians. How the mystery was made known to me, as I have written briefly before. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. This mystery is what? We, you know, we, we think of the gospel only as about going to heaven. That's what we think of the gospel. At that time, when Paul's proclaiming this, the gospel was, hey, you Gentiles, you can be part of this great thing God has going on with his people. You can be an equal with that. Okay? He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. They're members of the same body partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. See, we're gen we are, I don't know if there are any Jewish people in here. I, I, I'm my thinking that most everybody here is a Gentile. We kind of just take that for granted. But back at that time, this was, a, this was big news. This was controversial news. You don't have to do the things that, that they used to tell me. I, I don't have to do the things they used to tell me I had to do to become a believer and be part of the kingdom of God. To me, he says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches, uh, or unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in God or hidden for the ages in God who created all things. So he says, I've been given this task 
And I've been, it's been shown to me what this mystery is. It's been hidden up, hidden in God, in the wisdom of God all this time. And I'm going to explain it to you. That's who's standing in front of you now in Acts 20. Okay, now let's go on. He goes on in that scripture in Ephesians. He says, so that in order that through the church, the church, the Jew and the Gentile together, that was the church he was talking about. Through the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This is according to what? The eternal purpose. Now, think, we, we just read these scriptures sometimes. And I've spent the last few weeks since Mike asked me to talk about this, just staring at this, thinking about what that means. The eternal purpose he had planned has now been revealed, and he shows it to this guy, and this guy is now going around the world telling these people this story. All right? He's standing in front of you. Just pretend like you're at that meeting in, in Troas. All right? Now let's go on. Something that we, I don't know, I guess, I don't want to say kid about, but we talk about, Eutychus. And he falls out of this window. There, there are lamps, and you can go into all the reasons. And remember, on the first day of the week when they gathered, these, some of these people may have been laborers. They may have worked all day long. They're tired. They, they, this is not... Sunday, like we think of Sunday today, where we, most of us have the day off, and we come like this. These people may have labored all day, and they're here to hear about this story, and they want to see Paul. And you know that the people that have come before Paul, they had been with him in Ephesus when he'd been, you know, uh, uh, he was almost killed in Ephesus. They were probably with him on his other parts of the journey. You know that they got there several days ahead of him. They've been telling these people about Paul's journey and what he's going to talk about and the stories that he has to share. And they're here. And this guy, Eutychus, is here, and he gets sleepy. And he's overcome with sleep, whether it's from the, the, the lamps or whatever it is, the heat. He falls down three stories. Now, we have to kind of stop here and think about that. I don't know how high three stories is, but that's pretty high. You fall out on your uh, backwards, falling asleep, and you land on the ground, and you're dead. Now, we go running. Oh, we go running out now. Think about it. You got to think. We're running out the, window, running out the door. Here's this guy dead. And Paul comes rushing down, and what happens? Let's go on. He raised this guy and lifts him up. He says, don't be horrified. His life is in him. You can read all about different opinions on that. But the guy's life is restored. All right? And they go back up now to this room. And what happens? Paul continues to talk now. They break bread. This is after midnight. They break bread. And he talks until daybreak. Now, that's got to be a wonderful, wonderful experience to see somebody come back to life after falling three stories out of a window. All right? So Paul has done this. He comes back. This is the miracle. And here's what it says. And this is what I want us to take just a minute to think about. Seeing the miracle of the young man's corpse lifted up by Paul and raised to life greatly confirmed to them what Paul had preached. So let's say that you're at this group and you're at Troas and you're one of the people out there and you're just not sure. You're raised a Jew all your life and you've been raised to think certain things about the Gentiles and the uncleanliness and the things that they did and all those things. And Paul's here telling you all of this stuff is now they don't have to do that. Or you're a Gentile and he's saying you don't have to do these things any longer. You can now become part of this kingdom of God. All of these things happen. You might have some questions. You might have some doubts about what was being said. But I can guarantee you there's something that happened when they saw this. And Paul wrote in one of his letters, surely the signs of an apostle were done. He was saying, surely I have the same signs as other apostles. This would get your attention. It would confirm to you that what this guy said is worthy of our attention, worthy of being believed. He is the messenger of God. When it says, not a little comfort, uh, not a little comfort, not, not, go back just a second, stay there. There's this Go back one slide more. Uh, there's this little word at the bottom. Now, you and I speak English, and we have, let's see how I'm doing the time. We have, we have uh, expressions that we use. We have uh, uh, words of expression or terms that people know what you're saying when you do it. You've heard of uh, oh, uh, hyperbole, so you know what that means. You exaggerate on purpose just to make a point. You know what they're saying isn't true. I, I uh, you know, I, I die a million times before I go to the dentist. Or whatever. That's a hyperbole. 
All right? We know what those things mean. We don't realize sometimes what Luke was inspired to write in this book. There are probably 150, 200 expressions, ways of speaking in the Bible. And one of those is right here. When he says, they weren't a little comforted. That is called taponosis. taponosis. And what that is, is when you intentionally downplay something, but the reader knows that you mean just the opposite. All right? That's what was being said here. So we just read our Bibles quickly, and we say, oh, they were not a little comforted, and then they go back upstairs. That isn't what it's saying. He's saying, there was, let me tell you, there's great enthusiasm. You think how you would be if you'd just seen that. You would not just be sitting back down saying, okay, let's pick up where we left off. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there was great joy, great exuberance, great passion, great fear came upon Whatever you want to say, it was a big deal, a big disturbance. So when you read that, don't even, the, even the other interpretations that say they were greatly, you know, they were greatly comfortable. It's, it's a, little bit, a little bit stronger than that. It's really stronger than that. This is a big deal. So they're not a little comforted. Now we know the, 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 uh, the power of that event. A friend of mine asked me uh, weeks ago, why do you think Luke would put that in there? Well, I think this is why. Uh, I think you would remember the name of the guy who fell out the window that you saw come back to life, and I think you would remember what it meant to those people. And when he said, not a little comforted, we shouldn't just gloss over that. He's telling us this was a big deal. So they go back up stairs. He talks till morning. He's getting ready to part. He's made his plans. He's going to walk to this next city. They're going to go ahead in a ship, but he's going to walk, and they're going to meet him there, and they're going to pick him up, and they're going to go to Jerusalem, okay? Now, if you go on, Stuart, just for one second. One more slide. Now, I want you, I, I, I don't want to be hokey. I really don't. I'm not trying to be histrionic or anything crazy. But I want you just to look down for a minute or to look up for a minute, not look at the screen, you can close your eyes, whatever you want to do. But I want you to ask yourself, you're at that meeting in, in, in Troas that night. He's getting ready to leave. And I think when Paul leaves, he might have prayed something like this. So just look away for a minute. Go ahead, Stuart. Father, I pray that these people would understand we only see dimly. But one day we are going to see you face to face. I pray that these people will know how unbelievable and how great your power is, that you were able to work in Christ when you raised him from the dead. You gave him to be the head over the church, your body. And finally, I pray that they will have the strength to know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your love that passes all our knowledge, the love that never, ever fails. Now, to you be glory in the church, which is his body, because it's going to be worth it all. Amen. And he left. So when we read those prayers of Paul, think of, think of those prayers. Let your imagination think and put his letters into the book of Acts. Don't just read the book of Acts as history. This is a trial. You know, we can get up here and show maps and all. That's okay. But these are people. I'll never forget one time, I, I used to work with some physicians, and, and, and there was a doctor one time said to me, he was talking to a group of residents. He said, we talk about statistics. They were discussing a, a, pa a paper. And he must have thought that the resident was being a little bit flip when he was going through some of the side effects and other things from the study. And he stopped. He says, don't you ever forget Every number on that page is a person. Every statistic you're citing is a person. And don't ever take that lightly. And when we read the book of Acts, we shouldn't forget. This is not just about riding in a ship, going around place to place. That's part of it. This is about a person or people. And we need to let our minds really appreciate what they went through. Father, we're grateful to you for this time together. We're thankful that you've provided the Holy Spirit to help guide us into truth, to teach us, and to show us the way. 
And Father, may we not forget that we are the body. We are your people. We are members one of another. When one hurts, when Dave Kennedy dies, we feel it. When Dean falls, we feel it. When someone rejoices, we feel it. We are a body. We are your body. We are to be a light to the world. We don't look down on unbelievers. We try to be examples of the joy and the love and the peace that comes by knowing you so that we could be a light to the world. Thank you, Father, for this time together, for the freedom we have in this country to come together. We take it for granted so many times. We thank you for it and ask you bless each one of us as we go our way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Father Emmanuel, one of the most beautiful words we know, God with us. You are our strength. You are our peace. You are our love. It never fails. Father, may we go out and change people. May we go out people that know and understand this is a temporary walk. Help us to look at things eternal, to know that you have raised Jesus from the dead, and that all will be well. In Jesus' name, amen.